Hi, eighth hour. How are you? I know all of you were so excited when you saw me leave. You're like, finally, Miss Grady's gone. She's the worst. I'm so glad she's gone. Guess what? Digital Miss Grady is here. And I'm here to teach you everything that you need to know for today for our last day of notes for unit one. Couple of things. I need you to get out your debate paper. Okay, your John Brown debate paper. And I need you to get out your um, guided notes sheet that we've been filling out this whole unit. Um, I also need to turn, I need you to turn your heads to the back of the room, okay? And we're gonna look at the calendar together. Digital me is going to go through everything that's already on the calendar, okay? So make sure you get out those two pieces of paper while I'm talking. So today we are talking about how the Civil War begins. Uh, we will do a life in 2023 activity, which I will explain at the end here. Tomorrow is a half day, okay? It is safety day. So we are going over safety procedures. We will not be doing content, hence why today is our last day of notes. Thursday, we are prepping for our John Brown debate. We'll do our life in 2023 uh, activity then. And then Friday, you will do your John Brown debate. Okay, that is due. Your paper is due and we will do the debate in class. Next week on Monday, don't show up to school because we don't have any school and no one will be here. Well, maybe someone will be here, but I won't. Okay, so no school on Monday for Labor Day. Tuesday, we are reviewing for our unit one test. Wednesday, you will take that test and your guided notes sheet will be due. Okay, so make sure you're filling that out. And if you need another one, there's one on Google Classroom that you can print out. And then Thursday and Friday of next week, we will start our new unit, okay? So that is this week and next week in advance, according to the calendar. Now, swivel your seats. You're looking back at the calendar. Swivel your seats back to the screen because it's my time to shine. I'm the main character now. Um, by now, you should have your guided notes sheet out and your debate paper out. We're going to start things off. Uh, with a little um, bio about what I'm deciding to call our historical kid of the unit. Me and Mr. Snow were talking this summer and we were trying to find a way to have you guys um, be a little bit more connected and invested, basically pay more attention to the content that we're learning about. We talk a lot about uh, old guys, okay, throughout history. Um, especially those old guys at the back of my room at, at top, right? Those presidents. But I wanted to highlight, we wanted to highlight um, kids and, and historical figures that are around your age at the time period that we're learning about, okay? Um, so our first historical kid of the unit, these are kids that are around your age, meaning like middle school, early high school age. Um, our first historical kid of the unit for the pre-Civil War is Harriet Jacobs. Harriet Jacobs is born in 1813 and died in March, uh, on March 7th, uh, 1897 at age 84, okay? Uh, she is known for writing a book that uh, has a huge legacy and impact on what we know about the life of enslaved people in the past. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but notice how she doesn't have a specific date of when she was born. That is because a lot of slaveholders did not write down specific dates of when their slaves were born because they just didn't care to, they didn't think it was important. So that's why we don't have an exact date of when she was born. Um, early life, uh, when she was young, she was obviously born into enslavement. Both her parents were slaves. Um, she talks about how her parents really shielded her from the fact that she was somebody's property. She says, though we were all slaves, I was so fondly shielded that I never dreamed I was a piece of merchandise, right? She's talking about how um, her parents are trying to keep the idea that she is owned by someone else um, and not her own free person, um, trying to keep that from her as much as possible uh, so that she can have somewhat of a happy childhood. She is orphaned, unfortunately, at age six. She goes to live with her grandmother who is owned by the Hornablow family. That's like their actual name is Hornablow. Um, and she is taught to read by um, the mistress of the house, uh, the master's wife, Margaret Hornablow. At age 12, 
She is expected to be freed, similar to her grandmother. She's expected to gain her freedom. Unfortunately, though, the Hornablow family does not give her, uh, does not give Harriet her freedom. Instead, they give Harriet as a present uh, to their three-year-old niece, Mary Norcom, and she goes to live with the Norcom family. So just to put it once again, just to repeat that, because it sounds absurd, but it definitely happened. Um, Harriet is not given her freedom. She is given as a present because she is seen and treated as property to a three-year-old. So she is now under the ownership of a three-year-old, right? Which is absurd and insane, right? She moves into the Norcom household, okay? Um, at age 15, uh, Harriet Jacobs um, becomes a victim of Dr. Norcom, uh, who's Mary's father, his sexual harassment. Uh, he is constantly harassing her, um, constantly trying to abuse her. She's able to kind of evade that, kind of avoid that through different means. Um, she's also having to deal with Mrs. Norcom's jealousy because Mrs. Norcom doesn't look at her husband and say, oh my gosh, why are you going after a child? She then instead puts all the blame on Harriet, okay, and is constantly mistreating her in that way too. Um, age 20, Dr. Norcom had decided uh, to try and trap uh, Harriet by building an isolated cottage. Um, she knows that she's not going to be able to escape that. She's not going to be able to escape his abuse or harassment. So she has to do something to protect herself. So what does she do? She thinks that if she has a child with another man, she is going to be able to get her own protection and their child's protection. So she says, I knew nothing would enrage Dr. Flint. That's Dr. Norcom. She uses fake names in her book. So much as to know that I favored another. And it was something to triumph over my tyrant, even in that small way. Okay. So she thought that she, if she had another, um, if she had a child with another man, who in this case was white lawyer Samuel Sawyer, she could gain her and her child's protection because she thought that um, this guy would buy her freedom and also their child's. And so her relationship with Samuel Sawyer um, results in two kids. And she goes on to say that she was worried about Dr. Norcom selling her um, out of revenge. And she says, I was sure my friend, Mr. Sands, that Samuel Sawyer would buy me. He was a man of more generosity and feeling than my master. And I thought my freedom could uh, be easily obtained from him. The crisis of my fate now came so near that I was desperate. I shudder to think of being the mother of children that should be owned by my old tyrant. I knew as soon as a new fancy took him, his victims were sold far off to get rid of them, especially if they had children. So she's doing this out of protection, right? Protection for herself, protection for her children. At a certain point, um, Dr. Norcom, uh, Harriet overhears that Dr. Norcom is planning to force her children to work as plantation slaves. So she needs to act. She makes sure that her children are taken care of by Samuel Sawyer, makes sure that he is buying their freedom or has intentions of buying their freedom. And then when she is 22 years old in June of 1835, she makes her escape. She uh, escapes and hides out in a crawl space, which is kind of like an attic. Okay. She's not able to stand up. It's a very small space. Uh, she is in there for seven years, can only come out at night. Um, there are rats, mice, there's no lights, there's no ventilation. It's not a good place to be. Um, the only thing that's kind of keeping her going is this little hole that she's able to draw. I can't speak. The little hole that she's able to drill into the door of the crawl space. And she's able to see uh, across the way, her children who are now free, uh, playing outside. Okay. And so eventually when she's 29 years old, she finally escapes to New York city. She's reunited with her daughter. Uh, she moves to Rochester, New York, uh, Rochester, sorry, uh, where she works with the abolitionist newspaper, uh, by Frederick Douglass, uh, called the North star. Years later, she still can't avoid Dr. Norcom because she has to flee to Massachusetts to avoid him coming back and trying to take her back to um, the South. Eventually, she becomes legally free and she writes about her experiences 
in a book called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. This is the first time that a book discusses sexual harassment and abuse that many of these enslaved women had to endure during this time. It's the first time it's chronicled in a, in a literary work. So moving on from that, let's talk about Dred Scott. Dred Scott uh, was an enslaved uh, man who moves to a free state with his master. Once he is in the free state, he knows um, that according to law, okay, once an enslaved person is in a free state, uh, they can possibly sue for their freedom. So he does that, just that, right? He decides to sue for his own freedom um, and try to become a free man. His court case is known as the Dred Scott decision. It is taken to the Supreme Court where they decide that it he is not free and does not have the opportunity to sue for his freedom. And it reinforces this idea that uh, people of color are seen as property. This ruling said that African-Americans had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect, right? Previously, if an enslaved person was in a free state, they could gain their freedom in some way. This Dred Scott decision wipes all that out. That is not possible. It shows that Congress does not have the right to ban slavery in any way. You can visit um, where Dred Scott and his owner uh, actually lived for a time. It's out in Davenport in the Quad Cities on 2nd Street. There's a plaque there. That's a picture of the plaque. Let's talk about Lincoln and Douglas, okay? Uh, let's talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates. We're going to learn a lot about Lincoln's origin story at this point. So if you want to turn your turn your head and, and just look at Lincoln back there, I'm looking at him right now. He's staring right into my soul. He's got his hand on the book and his, his other hand's like this, okay? Um, we're going to learn about that guy right there, how, how he became that man in that cardboard cutout. All right, swivel your head back to me on the screen. So- Abraham Lincoln is facing off, not in the presidential election, not yet. First, it's the race for the Senate, okay? And so the Illinois Senate seat is up for grabs, and we have two people vying for it. First is Abraham Babe Lincoln, who we all know and love. He is running for the Republican side. Stephen Douglas is his opponent. He is running for the Democratic side. Abraham Lincoln, his current position is he is a lawyer, Okay. Um, like I said, he's a Republican. Uh, his stance on slavery is he's against the expansion of slavery. Notice how he is not against slavery. He is against the expansion of slavery. There's a difference, right? Against slavery, meaning we're getting rid of slavery in all forms, right? Against slavery, you are a hard no against slavery and you're trying to get rid of it. Against the expansion of slavery is a bit different. He's saying slavery in the states where it has always been, can stay there. But if any new states are admitted, he does not want them to be slave states. That seems a little bit different than the Lincoln that we know. Okay, we'll come back to that in the next slide. Stephen Douglas is his opponent. Okay, I forgot to talk about this, but uh, it's interesting to look at Lincoln without his beard. Okay, you can really see his cheekbones. Right, I was talking about that earlier, about how good his cheekbones are. Look at that. That's crazy. A lot of people think that um, he looks older in this picture. That's the consensus that we've seen all day. I'll, I'll let you make that ju judgment. Um, I do think that the beard makes him look a little bit younger. Anyway, um, Stephen Douglas is his opponent. He's a court judge. Uh, his political party is a Democrat. And his stance on slavery is he is for the expansion of slavery and for slavery in general. Obviously, because we learned yesterday that he helped create the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I'm going to read this quote. This is from one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates that happened in Ottawa, Illinois. Okay, I'm going to read this quote, and then I'm going to dissect it. And I want you to decide whether or not this, is, this sounds like the Lincoln that you know and love. Okay, So he says, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so. So I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong having the superior position. Let's, let's dissect that because as my second hour said, he's talking too fancy for us, okay? So we gotta dissect it, we gotta break it up, that first part. He says, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere 
with, with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. Interfere, meaning get involved. He's saying, I have no intention of or, or desire to get involved with any of the slave states currently. He then goes on to say, I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong having the superior position, saying white people are in the superior position, and I agree with that, and so does Judge Douglas. That's what he's saying here. Now, you may be thinking, that doesn't sound like the Lincoln that I know, right? When we think of a uh, Babe Lincoln, right, we think of freeing the slaves, right? The Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, ending slavery. And that's true, right? He did end slavery and he was against slavery, but I want to talk about where he was at this point. This is his first political election, his first time kind of being involved in a debate. He wants to gain votes. And sometimes when we want other people to like us and we want to gain votes like he is here, we're going to say what they want to hear. Not necessarily what we believe wholeheartedly, but we're going to change our, our stance to kind of like appease the voters. And I think that's kind of what he's doing here. He also could have believed this and then evolved a little bit later. Okay, that's definitely true. We evolve our beliefs and stuff over time. That's normal. That's natural, right? It's normal to learn new things and change our, our stance on things, right? But it's just interesting to look at where Lincoln is coming from here to where he ends up, right? So here's the tour, the 1858 Senate tour. They go to Ottawa. They go to Freeport. They're given debates in Jonesboro, Charleston, Galesburg, Quincy, Alton, okay? I really wish this t-shirt existed. I think Mr. Shamp's going to work on it for me, hopefully. Gosh, it's such a cool, wouldn't it be cool if I just had these for sale during this lecture? I think that'd be funny, All right? So why didn't Lincoln win the Senate? Because spoiler alert, he doesn't win the senatorial race, okay? Link, uh, Douglas does. But he doesn't win because he's really not well known at this point. And also he doesn't win due to gerrymandering. Okay, we'll talk more about gerrymandering later this year. But gerrymandering you learned a little bit about last year. It's basically drawing boundaries of election districts to favor a polit particular political party over another. So when they, when the party that wants to win, hence right now is the Democrats, right, in this election with Lincoln, um, they're going to draw the boundaries of election districts to make sure that there's a majority of Democrats in every district so that they can win, okay? And so that's gerrymandering. But the good thing about this election is, even though he doesn't win, it brings Lincoln into the spotlight, Okay. And you know what they say about the spotlight? Sometimes it gets a little bit too bright. See that? If you weren't paying attention, I'm going to do it again. Okay, and take two. Watch Lincoln and three, two, one. Sometimes, you know what they say about the spotlight? Sometimes it's a little bit too bright. Look, because I put sunglasses on Lincoln. Get it? Okay, I really hope you're laughing right now. I'm in an empty classroom. And obviously no one's laughing, okay? But I think that's hilarious. I'm going to go back and do it one more time. Too bright. Boom. All right, anyway. God, you hate digital me too. You hate physical me and digital me. You're like, oh, I'm sick of both of them. Anyway, almost done. We're almost done. So the election of 1860. This is where things get real. We're going forward in time. Lincoln is now up for presidential election. The South is mad. They are angry, okay? They South Carolina is saying, I'm going to talk in a Southern accent to be South Carolina. Are you ready? South, Car South Carolina is saying, you know what? If Lincoln gets elected, isn't this really good? This is a good Southern accent. If Lincoln gets elected, we're going to leave. We're going to go build our own country. We're going to make our own country. It's going to be called the Southern States, the Confederate States of America. If Lincoln wins this presidential election, we're out of here, partner, Okay. That was really good. I know you can applaud if you need to, but all right, stop, stop the applause. Stop it. So Lincoln, spoiler alert, does win much to South Carolina's annoyance and anger. He wins 40% of the votes. What's interesting about this, Lincoln is not on 
10 Southern states voting ballots. When you go to vote for president, for example, when I went to vote for president, there were a couple names on that ballot that they handed me to fill in the bubble to vote. There was Joe Biden, there was Donald Trump, and there was Kanye West. And I know you're saying, Kanye West, how'd he get on there? He was eligible to be on the ballot, okay? And so everyone that was eligible to be on the ballot was on the ballot, regardless of what you think, right? The Southern states, the 10 Southern states that are doing this in the 1860 election are going against the rules. They're going against the law. You need to have all the choices on there, whether you believe in them or not, okay? That's crazy that they would do that. It's really not though, because they, I mean, they're so against Lincoln at this point. They're, they're just begging to leave the union, right? And so when Lincoln is elected, the Southern states are like, see ya, we're gonna build our own country. And it's going to be called the Confederate States of America. And it's going to be exactly like the United States of America. We're going to copy paste, but we're going to change some things. Like we're going to have our own president. It's going to be that guy, Jefferson Davis, who's got some really weird facial hair going on, but we won't talk about that. Okay. So that's what's going to happen there. Thus starts the Civil War. Okay. The very first battle of the Civil War is Fort Sumter. Who shot first at Fort Sumter? The Confederacy. What's the Confederacy going to say? They're going to blame it on the North. The Confederacy, the South is going to lie so many times during this war. They will lie about different details. They will lie about winning. They will lie about whether or not they are doing better than the North, right? And it's all to make them look better, okay? So for example, they're not calling it the Civil War in the South. They're calling it the War of Northern Aggression. Basically putting the blame on the North, even though they're the ones that left first. Okay. And so we'll talk more about the civil war next week when we start our next unit. And that is it. That is all I have for you today, but for notes, stay, stay, stay in your seats. Okay. Because I have this to say, I have to, I have to talk about this paper. It says describe life in 2023. When I say go, you are going to come to wherever the sub has uh, these papers. Okay. There's the sub's going to hold that paper up right now. So you know where it is. Okay. You're going to go grab one of these papers. Okay. And we talked about this. We talked about primary sources and secondary sources last week. Okay. You are going to fill this out as if you are creating a primary source for life in 2023. According to you, what is life like in 2023 in politics and entertainment? What do you like to listen to? What movies do you like to watch, right? What is your daily life like? What is your world? Like what's happening in the world? Anything interesting? What's the economy? Are people making money? Are people losing money? Are people getting jobs? Are people losing jobs? Things like that. Climate. What's the climate like? Not what's the weather like outside, but like what's our climate? Is it changing, right? Science. Are there any scientific inventions or advancements that we've made in the medical field or inventions or anything like that? What are our rights as people? Do people have rights? Do some people not have rights? Okay. Do some people have more rights than others? And then the other part of this, it says, ooh, can you see it? It says other. Anything else you want to tell me about? Okay. Anything else you think is it is important that if we were to dig this up in the year 3000, for them to know about life in 2023. So if you want to tell me about how LeBron James is worse than Michael Jordan and he'll never be Michael Jordan, like you can write that there. If you want to tell me about how Olivia Rodrigo's album comes out soon, because that's important, right? I I would agree. Um, you can write literally anything there, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this will be due on Thursday. We're going to do an activity with it on Thursday. Um, I, hold on. I got to, I got to think of the thought It went out of my head. I only need you to write a, a sentence or two for each one. Okay. Sentence or two, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, name at the top, class hour. That is it. That's all I have. When you are done with this, you should be working on your John Brown debate, which is due on Friday. If you're done with that, if you're done with both things and you're just a rock star, do something quietly at your desk. Don't be annoying, okay? 
Um, I will see you all tomorrow for safety day. Um, and if you have any questions, send me an email. I will be at a cross country meet and I will be driving a warrior wagon. So my communication skills will not be very good um, for the next couple of hours, but send me an email anyway, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. All right. Bye guys. I miss you. Be good. You know who I'm talking to.